Well, we've um, been commenting before the service of some of the difficulties in the world and the troubles facing us. But my title for this evening is what are, you, what are you really like? What are you really like? Now after God, after Elihu, he began a good and, fair, and fairly, this man Elihu speaking to Job, the first couple of the chapters he spoke very well. But then in chapter 34, the last chapter, I was saying that he became rather unfair to Job. And in this chapter he continues in the same way however and it's a big however Elihu's arguments are good arguments against all that are ungodly they're good arguments they just don't apply to Job therefore rather than us tonight repeating why Elihu is not being fair to Job that you can go on and on with that subject we will apply his preaching to ourselves and even if we're suffering like Job is suffering we will still benefit from considering our ways so that we might be more humbled before the Lord and become more patiently dependent upon the Lord and thus growing in grace and in faith so I ask you directly and I don't mean it in a rude way, and I ask it to myself too, what are you really like? What are you really like? And the first, I've got this as five small points. The first one, do you think you're a good person? Do you think you're a good person? Elihu, verse 1, spake moreover and said, Thinkest thou this to be right, that thou saidst, my righteousness is more than God's. Well, this isn't what Job said, but we're applying this to ourselves because it is, it is an excellent way of putting things. If someone said, my righteousness is more than God's, can you imagine someone thinking that they're so good? Well, you may think that's an absurd thing to say to somebody. But actually, a person that thinks that they're good doesn't need God. If we're good, we don't need God because we're good anyway. And we don't realise. If we think we're good, we don't realise that we're under God's judgment. We don't realise he's our maker. We don't consider him that he might punish us because there's no sin to be punished for so God is irrelevant to him and in this way he's really saying my righteousness is more than God's and so in this way in this attack that Elihu makes he, he is challenging the person that thinks that they're good what, that they haven't sinned. I've done nothing wrong. Wow. They say, is, is your righteousness more than God's? Do you really think that you're more righteous than God? Well, that would be the case. Let us beware lest we think such of ourselves, that we're good, that we're so good, we won't, don't need the gospel. The gospel is only for the lost. The gospel is only for sinners. Well, Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made, the law is not made for a righteous man. Jesus didn't come to save the righteous, did he? But for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel 
of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. So only sinners need the law. The righteous are fine. No, well, it's not. Who is righteous then? The Bible says none is righteous. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Let us then beware ourselves that we don't think that we're so righteous, we're so good, that if we're going to say that, we're actually saying my righteousness is more than God's. You may say, well, it's equal with God. As soon as you realise who we really are, we realise that we will be going down a very blasphemous road to think such of ourselves. But this is the danger of not seeing what we're really like. If you think of everyone you know, I often say this in open-air preaching, you'll find that there's a lot wrong with everyone, apart from yourself. That's how we tend to think. Everyone else is to blame. We very rarely will find something wrong with ourselves. But if you look at the evidence, that you can see that there's things wrong with everybody else, morally, that they can't be, that they're not holy, they're not godly, then we've got to admit it for ourselves. Otherwise, we are in great danger here of this extremity of making ourselves more righteous than God himself. A horrible thing to think of, of ourselves. Oh, what are we meant to do? We're supposed to be humble before the Lord. We're supposed to, to, to trust that Jesus Christ is the Saviour and in him we will be saved. Let us not be despairing if we find ourselves thinking that we're not what we should be because Jesus Christ is the Saviour of sinners and the sooner that we're open and honest and plain about it, the better. That when we come to him for mercy and for, for forgiveness, for everlasting life, that he died on the cross for sinners. But then secondly, what are we really like? Are we justifying ourselves? Are we justifying ourselves? I put, I've put ourselves rather than yourself. I think it's, I don't want to sound harsh. I'm not, and not even of any of these things, I'm not thinking of anyone here, I can assure you. It's up to you to analyse your own consciences. For thou said, verse 3, this is, this is Elihu speaking to Job. What advantage will it be unto thee? And what profit shall I have if I be cleansed from my sin? Now, we could probably take many angles at this text and, and a lot. And if you read, if we had the time to read all the sermons of Joseph Carroll that preached whole sermons on individual verses, uh, then we could consider very many aspects of this here. But just very simply, what that what he's he's accusing Job. You said, look, what advantage would it be if I'm cleansed from my sin? I'm in such a bad state now. What's the point? And Elihu, he's as if Job just not going to bother. We're not going to bother with any effort in the Christian life. We're not going to bother with any form of holiness because. Well, everyone comes out the same, don't they? Does it make any difference to God? Elihu preaches here against this typical way of thinking of wicked people. This is a terrible danger that we see that the godly are no better off in the world than the wicked. Very often, they suffer. So what's the point of being sorry about our sins? Therefore, we may be tempted to go along with an outward form of religion, be a part of a church, but have no real repentance. We're not that bothered about holiness and a change. I was reading something earlier on, uh, words to the effect, it was to do with, in the book of Proverbs, that, that our concern as Christians should be to please God to the highest level that's within all our powers, whatever comes of it, not about whether we do well at work because of it or in our family, we serve God faithfully, as, as faithfully as we possibly, and he'll enable us to do. 
But here, we're being accused or challenged that we don't have a cynical attitude. And Christians can become like that. They can say, well, I've, tr I've tried very hard in my Christian life and, and uh, it really doesn't make any difference. I'm just going to sit back and have a laid-back attitude. What advantage is it? What profit is it if I'm cleansed from my sin? Does it make any difference? I can tell you it does. There's nothing better, nothing better than a clear conscience with God. Whatever you've done in the past, when we come to the Lord, and see, the cynical person will say, well, I know I'm going to sin again, so I won't come with repentance now. Well, that's not right. That's the wrong, wrong, wrong attitude. We, are to, we, we will find forgiveness with the Lord and we're to be thoroughly sorry where we've offended in God's ways. You see, an unbeliever, an unbeliever tells lies. The world is full of lies. Small lies, big lies and everything that lies in between. Uh, the, the world just lies. They don't even blush when they lie. They can't, I suppose. It will give them away. Because they believe they can get away with it. It won't make any difference to them. If it's convenient, a lie of convenience, a sin of convenience, then they go straight through it. And they, most of the time, of course, they get away with it. We must plead with God, plead with God to save us from such an attitude. It will be such a hindrance to our Christian life. Now, there's the word, I was thinking of the word pragmatic. Someone says, oh, I'm very pragmatic. And often that they mean is that I'm completely compromising um, to be able to do what I want to do. I'm being pragmatic. I'm abandoning the law of God just, just for today because I want to do a certain thing. I'm being pragmatic. That's not being pragmatic. That's being sinful. To be pragmatic or practical it's very small things. It's like whether we decide to be in the garden or in the house today. That's being pragmatic. Oh, it's a bit hot, we'll be outside. Not to turn to sinful ways. So let us be very careful that we're not justifying ourselves and say, what will it profit if I'm cleansed from my sin? I can just carry on with hidden secret sin. We must be truly seeking God with fear and trembling that he will grant us true Repentance. So that's the second thing. Are you justifying yourself? Third thing. Do you really, I emphasize it, really believe in God? Do you really believe in God? He must believe that God is, that, that comes to him in Hebrews chapter 11. Those that come to God must believe that he is. And it's a funder in the, you'd have read, those of you who have read that ourselves by Brownlow North, one of the early chapters he made great emphasis in his, evangel in his evangelism that he would always emphasize people must come to a knowledge that God is. We're, we're not dealing with how I feel and or, will Christianity make me feel better or have I got the right uh, logical outline of certain doctrines. It's God is. There's a fear of God. And then you see, then we must be humbled. But he, I asked the question, do you really believe in God? Because Elihu goes on, he says, I will answer thee and thy companions with thee. As if, as if Job is actually um, uh, saying that he, he doesn't need to worry. He don't need to bother about these things. You, don't, you can count yourself as good. You can, you can say that you're justified. You can make your excuses. But he says, God is there. He says, look, he says. Look unto the heavens, verse 5, and see and behold the clouds which are higher than thou. The clouds are higher. Well, we get, there's barely a cloud. There's some clouds there. And, well, how small are we? Uh, one man was very successful as a preacher. Use the word successful. He ended up flying everywhere in America, preaching in different places every week. Someone said, how did you manage to keep it not going to your head? He said, and, and how did you keep it well, humble? He says, well, I could see when I flew over those cities, 
how small everyone was. And I'm, I'm the preacher, but I realise that that's me. I'm just one of these tiny, tiny people. And so, if we really believe in God, we are very, very small. If thou be righteous, what givest thou him? And it says, if thou sinnest, what dost thou do against him? Verse 6. Or if thy transgressions be multiplied, what doest thou unto him? If thou be righteous, what givest thou him? Or what receivest he of thine hand? He's now adding this further perspective that the heavens and the clouds which Job knows God has made, God has made it all, and they're so high and we're so small. Do you really believe that God is up above all there? Are you really saying that you're righteous and good in the face of the almightiness of God? And then he says, well, what could you, um, what would you do against him? If you sinned, what would, if you were righteous, what would you give him? Or what would he receive? From, what could you actually do for God? And the doctrine that underlies this it's called the impassibility of God, which, which means that God doesn't change. He knows everything from the beginning to the end, from the time of infinitely. And as uh, the Westminster Confession says that God is without parts or passions. That doesn't mean that God doesn't care, but that only that he's not changed, he's not harmed by what we do, He's not surprised by what we do. Nothing we can do can change God. Nothing we can do, good or bad, can affect God. Of course, God is angry at sin, we know that. Uh, this is a difficult idea, but what it means is that we need to be rather careful. It isn't saying that it doesn't matter if you're good or bad, because it won't affect God. But it does, it does matter. If we really believe that God is there, even though there will be, as it seems to us, no effect. If we do something good, God's the same. Something bad, something God is the same. He doesn't change. But don't let that deceive you into thinking that God doesn't see your sin. He doesn't know and he doesn't judge. And we see even in verse 8 there that the wickedness, thy wickedness may hurt a man as thou art and thy righteousness may profit the son of man. He's saying here is that man uh, cannot establish his own righteousness with God because God cannot be affected. The idea of man being righteous, then somehow making himself acceptable to God is impossible. Now, whether we fully understand this or I've quite expressed it here, we should at least be still and admit our complete inability and that our righteousness is never going to fit us for communion with God. Think of the difference, that first one of the, 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 the clouds and the sky, and then there's us. What would God have to do with us? What could we do to be righteous with God? We're wholly unfit to be the companions of God. Let us be sure that we have a suitably high view of God. Otherwise, we will be haughty rather than humble and never be born again unto everlasting life it would be it would be as if we didn't really believe in god if we thought we were naturally companions with god it would be as though we didn't believe but consider what that would be i've often thought about this if we really didn't believe that there was God, then what is the alternative? The alternative is that there's nothing. The alternative is what our brother said at the beginning, that the worst things could happen if we 
were, as it were, under an atheist power, and it was really enforced upon us. Now, I, I have hope that, that God will have a restraining influence. God turns the heart of kings. He turns the heart of presidents. He can turn the heart of prime ministers. He can put the fear of God into them. And that must be our, our great prayer, that such would happen. But the, the, the idea that we could just be literally if we behaved as people that didn't believe in God, but we pretended to, we would be most rotten. And, and to be superficial like that. Well, Elihu is falsely accusing Job of this. That uh, Job is, um, is uh, claiming to be above all and untouched. So, but if we do believe, if we do, if we, if we have that conscience that has caused us to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that we should have a real fear of God, uh, then um, we should have a real fear of God. If, if we really believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then we're not the sort of people who are to be making excuses for ourselves, thinking that we're good, justifying ourselves, but we will have a real fear of the Lord, which is not a terror in a sense, because we know that Jesus Christ is our Saviour, and we're determined to use all the help we can get, to find all the help we can get, to cause us to walk humbly before him and there'd be much assurance in that there's great assurance in trusting in Christ if we think of ourselves very very low and without any strength God will be gracious to us in Jesus Christ and then fourthly do we believe in God do we are we good are we justifying ourselves thinking we're good and then are we proud well a touch on this subject and this is it comes in a strange context here because it seems like those that are oppressed those that are uh, those that are poor can be proud too verse 9 to 12 by reason of the multitude of oppressions they make the oppressed to cry they cry out by reason of the arm of the mighty. But none saith, Where is God my maker, who giveth songs in the night, who teacheth us more than the beasts of the earth, and maketh us wiser than the fowls of, he fowls of heaven? There they cry, but none giveth answer because of the pride of men. And again, there may be, with a, these poetic verses, there may be different senses and this is just the particular application I'll apply to, to it as, as it is here, as, as I can see it here. Elihu describes, describes the godless cries of the oppressed. You can be oppressed and godless. You can be poor and proud. This is a hard passage then, in a sense, isn't it? Because we feel sorry. We feel sorry for the oppressed and downtrodden. Maybe we feel it that we ourselves are oppressed and downtrodden. But these ver verses teach that the poor who are oppressed can be proud, covetous, just as badly as the rich. The poor can be just as bad. It doesn't, just because we have incidents in the Bible of the rich abusing the poor, it doesn't make every poor person righteous. They must be poor in spirit. We must be poor in spirit. This is seen by what fools they are here. They cry by reason of the arm of the mighty. They cry because they press. But verse 10, but none saith, where is God my maker? None of them are, saying, none of them are looking for God. And you wouldn't mind... Um, I don't want to go overly bored on politics, but but the 
yes, by all means, attack the present government, but on the basis of its ungodliness, true ungodliness, and then offer, provide an alternative for people to know and to be encouraged in the blessing of the Lord. That's what Britain was built on, the Protestant constitution. But just uh, complaining about oppression, but not crying out to God. It's futile. It won't work. It will not solve the problem. Oppression needs a cry out to God. That's where the victory is. This is seen by what fools they are. They're seen in here what fools they are, crying in misery, but not crying to God. This is our nation in its political misery today. And Elihu points out two particular blessings that are missed by this root of proud sin. They say, where is God my maker? They do not say, sorry, they do not say, where is God my maker who giveth songs in the night? This is the first blessing that they're missing. The songs in the night. Pride is the sin of fools. And Elihu has hit the nail on the head, not for Job, but he's hit the nail on the head for sin. Pride will not cry out to God. Pride puts itself in place of God. The, uh, God is unnecessary to the proud because the proud sees himself at the top of the tree. And what foolishness. The blessings, the first blessing, the songs of the night. Where it, they should, where is God my maker who giveth songs in the night? This is what the Lord would give to the oppressed and the poor. Songs in the night, given by God. What a wonder. I don't know, we've had hot nights and maybe you've woken up and you haven't been singing. You've just wanted to get back to sleep. But we may literally wake up in the night and start singing like a bird, singing the psalms. But chiefly, the songs in the night that we delight in from the Lord are the um, thoughts. It's a tune, a happy thought, a happy tune. The believer may wake up and rather than terror, he will find that the Lord is with him. The Lord is with him and he can sing his praise. The song in the night at its spiritual fullness is that a believer in his darkest moment knows the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and has peace and joy in his heart. The proud does not. Are you proud? Or do, have you come to know the songs in the night by the one that's cried out, for the mercy of God. It's quite different, isn't it? Quite a different way. And Elihu has really hit uh, on a precious theme here. That the believer knows the uh, songs in the night when he tr cries out, where is God, my maker? He doesn't just cry out in his oppression. He's not just blaming the whole world. And then secondly, the proud that doesn't submit to God misses out on the teaching of wisdom. Verse 11, who teacheth us more than the beasts of the earth and maketh us wiser than the fowls of heaven. There they cry, but none giveth answer because of the pride of evil men. Because of the pride of evil men, they will not seek the Lord. They won't receive the songs in the night, the mercy, the forgiveness, the blessing of God, and they won't receive the wisdom of God. He teacheth us more than the beasts of the earth. Think of the little animals that you see around. Aren't they wise? How they manage, how they live, or the, the, the fowls of the heavens, the birds. Remarkable lives, short lives they live. But he gives, he gives us more teaching and wisdom, and the proud misses out on all this and continues oppressed. Are we proud or do we come to Jesus Christ as believers and receive the wisdom of God?
the believer trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ to save him from sin and from death and from hell. What wisdom is found there. What power from God. What a marvel by the Spirit of God. Here is life in Jesus Christ. Wonderful. I'm alive forever and ever. Come rain, come shine, come enemies, come governments changing or whatever. We're alive unto God. 1 Corinthians 1.30 But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. These are marvellous things. Wisdom is the wisdom of Jesus Christ coming to a person that would be proud, that would think he was good, that would be justifying himself, that would be living in ig ignorance. And there is wisdom, the Saviour. The saviour of sinners. Now I'm right with God. Now I'm prepared for the eternity to come. And he's my righteousness. And he in him is sanctification. The washing of the blood of Christ counts as righteous. But we're washed, we're clean, we're holy, we belong to him and we're redeemed. So that's the fourth thing. Are you proud? Let's pray that the Lord will take away any pride in us, that we'll come to him humbly for mercy. I often think I can fix something. How few times we pray for the help that we need. Now, fifthly and lastly, are we vain? I've changed it again from you. I'm sorry, I can't be too direct with you. Are we vain? Surely God, verse 13. This is attacking Job again, but I'm saying it may apply more to us than to Job. Verse 13, surely God will not hear vanity. God, will not, that's what it is, Job. Are you vain? Are you suffering because you're vain? We're, we're not, it's, it's a bit like pride, isn't it? It's a similar, similar thing to pride. There can be reasonable pride. I took to the, uh, I went to the dry cleaners and the man in there, how are you, how are you? Yes, he says, my daughter has just got her, her doctor, she's just becoming a doctor, I'm working hard in a, in, a, in a dry cleaner shop all his life, this man. Now his daughter has got her doctorate. Her son has, his son has got a first class degree in accounting and finance. He's, and he's rightly, in a sense, proud. A proud father, it's lovely to see it. I thought, well done, well done. But the horrible pride of man before God is quite different to that. But vanity, let's beware of vanity. Neither will the Almighty regard it. Was this Job's problem? I don't think it was, but are we sure? we're pretty sure it wasn't. But is it our problem? Although thou sayest thou shalt not see him, yet judgment is before him. Therefore trust thou in him. But now, because it's not so, he has visited in his anger, yet he knoweth it not in great extremity. The visiting anger upon a man. God's anger, if God's anger is upon us. He's visited us. It's a warning. It may be a warning that there's worse to come. It's vital we stop making excuses. They are mere vanity. And while the last verse was wrongly applied to Job, woe to us if it applies to us. Verse 16, Therefore doth Job open his mouth in vain. You see, he's saying it's in vain. It's, if a vanity sometimes means things are in vain. It's just something that's passing away. He opens his mouth in vain. He's multiplying words without knowledge. It's vanity. It's passing away. We fear that such is the case with many today. Many lives are quite in vain. Far from God. Now, I'm not applying this just to you. You can apply these tests to other... When you apply them to other people. If we're preaching to others, this is the natural man, man in his natural state of vanity, of pride, of thinking himself good enough, of justifying himself. He's effectively living as if there's no God. And that, that, is the, that is the trouble today. People living, ignoring the warning signs. 
But what a great gospel we have to, to, to preach to those that are lost, those that are living in this state far from God, or to restore those of us in who these temptations are rising up among us. So do you think you're a good person or you can justify yourself or even a sense that you don't really believe in God or you're proud or vain? This wasn't Job's, Job's case, but woe to us if it's ours. This is the case of people that are hypocrites who claim to be Christians but are not. If it is our case that we find these sins overwhelming within us, we fall down before God, ask him to be merciful to us, and we can be sure. You think, I can't believe God can forgive me anymore. And I think that's one of the worst temptations, that we set ourselves a low standard because we think we, we've, we can't reach any further but we should fall down before God to be merciful to us and he'll show us his songs in the night. His uh, songs in the night and he'll teach us the wisdom like the, like the animals and the birds, but even greater than their wonderful things. God will be merciful to you even after many years of backsliding. The Lord restores those years to his people, to all that come to Jesus Christ. In this miserable, troubled world, immense and glorious hope is given. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as we call upon thee and as we pray to thee, we ask for the forgiveness of all our sins. Lord, we know in us is a sinful nature that is far from the holiness and the spiritual mindedness that, that, that should be found in the people of God. And we pray that thou will be gracious to us and forgive us all of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross and that thou would restore to us a, a life of joy and peace in believing and a reassurance of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that though our sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as wool, and though they be as crimson, they shall be white as snow. O oh Lord, we thank Thee for these promises, the precious promises of our Saviour. O oh Lord, we do pray for friends, neighbours and loved ones who know not the Lord Jesus Christ, who continue to walk in these ways of their own goodness, <coughs> justifying themselves, living as if there's no God, and effectively being proud. Effectively being proud and vain and without hope. Oh Lord, we know these things lead to disaster and to thy judgment. So we pray for thy great mercy to be extended widely. Oh Lord, make us godly examples to those around us. May these sins that we've read about be strange to us and far from us. Oh Lord, we thank Thee that we have nothing, no need to try and boast of ourselves, no need to try to pretend that we're more righteous than any, because the Lord Jesus is our righteousness, our only righteousness, and we pray that He may have all the glory and all the honour in His precious name. Amen.